My name is Dr. Sarah Myhill and I'm here speaking for Life the Basic Manual. In chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, we know that infection is a big player. And the starting point to treat any infection is to improve the defences. As I grow older and perhaps wiser, um, I have just woken up to the fact that I personally can't treat everybody in the world, but they can treat themselves. And my job is to give them the rules of the game and the tools of the trade so they can do it themselves. And those rules and those tools are available to everybody. You don't need to go and see an expensive doctor or even have expensive tests. You can do an awful lot yourself because getting the basic things right gets you an awful long way there. And the starting point for treating any infection, whether it's bacteria, viral, yeast, or whatever, is diet. Now, humans evolved as um, as part of an arms race. Um, uh, you know, we are a free lunch and I suspect or I believe that one of the ways that we escaped that infectious load is because our metabolism can work perfectly well, indeed very well indeed, running on fat. We've been subject to 30 years of very poor nutritional advice that says we should be fueling our body with carbohydrates and sugars but the trouble is that is food for microbes. And so the starting point to treat any infection is to starve them out. Don't feed them with carbohydrates. Don't feed them with sugars. And any carbohydrates we do eat get digested in the gut to sugar and will spike a blood sugar. One example of this is we know diabetics are particularly prone to getting infections. And it's one way in which diabetes is picked up is because somebody suddenly starts to get recurrent chest infections or recurrent urinary tract infections or terrible dental caries or whatever. So, the ketogenic diet is a very good starting point. Once that is established, what else can we put in place? We need a basic package of nutritional supplements. Why? Because the immune system is enormously demanding of micronutrients such as zinc, such as selenium, uh, such as B vitamins. Without that, the immune system cannot function. And the third thing is that the immune system is enormously demanding of energy. One good example of this is that if a fit and healthy person suddenly develops flu, all the energy of the body goes to feeding the immune system to fight that infection and that person becomes bed bound. They're pole they cannot move. And quite right too, because we need all the energy of the body to fight that infection. So energy delivery mechanisms are also an important part of the immune system. And we know people who are hypothyroid, if their thyroid is running slow, then they will be cold, their immune system will be going slow, and they will be particularly susceptible to infections. There are some authorities that believe maybe up to 40% of Western women are hypothyroid for various reasons, the reasons of iodine deficiency or toxicity. Uh, diet, again, is an essential part of fueling the body. So in the treatment of any infections, we're also looking at the basic workup to treat chronic fatigue syndrome, as detailed before. The car analogy is very helpful. The diet is the fuel in the tank. The mitochondria are the engines of our car. And we now have very simple nutritional and detox interventions which improve mitochondrial function reliably well. We then need to improve the thyroid function and look at adrenal function. So improving the energy delivery mechanisms is an essential part of Im improving immune function. But an incredibly useful tool that I have found recently is vitamin C. I say I found it recently. I've known about it for many years, but it's only now that I'm putting it into proper use. Because vitamin C is the best antibiotic in the world bar none. Why? There is no microbe that is resistant to vitamin C. It kills everything. And its safety is fantastic. It's, you can inject hundreds of grams of this into the muscle, into the, into the veins, uh, and bar one unusual complication, which is in uh, detail elsewhere, uh, it is extraordinarily safe stuff. It doesn't cause kidney problems, contrary to popular um, kidney stones, contrary to popular belief. It's a wonderfully safe tool. But the key thing about vitamin C is the dose. And this is the same for any antibiotic. If I prescribed an antibiotic for a condition in a tenth of the required dose, it would be ineffective. The dose has to be right. 
And the key thing to vitamin C is that the dose is individual um, to people and people have to work out the dose for themselves. And this has been a huge stumbling block. We are so used to being told, oh, and the dose is so, you know, 500 milligrams three times a day or whatever, that people struggle to get their, their heads around the, the necessary dose of vitamin C. The key to vitamin C is it has to be taken to bowel tolerance. Now, I use vitamin C in two ways. I use it for people need to take vitamin C on a regular basis just to stay well. And then people you need to take much bigger dose of vitamin C in the event of any acute infection. So let's take myself as an example. Work done by Linus Pauling tells us that the daily requirement of vitamin C is somewhere between four grams and 15 grams. Now, compared that to the recommended daily amount of, of vitamin C, which is 30 milligrams, it's you know a hundredth of the dose that we're talking about. Now, that dose of 30 milligrams will stop you getting scurvy, but it certainly will not allow the immune system to work at its best. So ignore the recommended daily amounts of vitamin C, take what Linus Pauling recommended. Linus Pauling, the winner of two Nobel Prizes in his own right, he was only beaten to a third by Watson and Crick, very clever man, devoted the last third of his life to vitamin C research. So we should all be taking a daily dose of vitamin C at least five grams, but ideally bowel tolerance. The first place the vitamin C starts to work is on the gut. And as I detailed before, the upper gut should be a sterile, acidic gut for digesting uh, protein and fat and for killing microbes. The lower gut should be a fermenting gut to ferment fibre, and it ferments fibre into short-chain fatty acids, which are a very good fuel. When you start to take vitamin C, it kills everything. And the first thing it will do is it will clean up the upper gut. So as you start to take vitamin C, it kills any fermenting microbes that, they, that may be there and washes them down into the lower gut. Now, when I started trying vitamin C, uh, I thought I'd got a pretty good gut function. And so I started to increase the dose by a few grams every day. And to my embarrassment and horror, I got to 35 grams before I developed diarrhea. That's called taking vitamin C to bowel tolerance. Now my bowel tolerance is about eight grams. If I take 10 grams, I start to kill some of the microbes downstream. They get fermented by others downstream and you get very offensive wind. More than um, 12 grams and they kill friendly microbes in the lower gut and you get diarrhea. We don't want that, but it's a very useful marker that we've arrived at the optimum dose of vitamin C. So everybody should be taking at least five, maybe 15 grams, i.e. a sub-diarrheal dose just to maintain good health and optimize one's longevity. We then have the second way in which vitamin C is used, which is to treat acute infection. Now, there's a wonderful quote by Dr. Fred Klenner. Um, I love it. He says, you know, um, all patients should take vitamin C to bowel tolerance in all pathological conditions whilst the physician ponders the diagnosis, i.e. Don't wait until you've been diagnosed with flu or a chest infection or a urinary tract infection or whatever. Take vitamin C to bowel tolerance straight away. Now, the way I recommend people do that is at the first symptom of any infection, a bit of a sore throat, a bit of a runny nose, a bit of a tickle, take 10 grams at once. If the symptoms haven't gone in one hour, take another 10 grams. If the symptoms haven't gone in one hour, take another 10 grams, and so on, until you get diarrhea. It's a little bit like if you were defending a country, when the invading army lands on the beaches, you blast them off the beaches with machine gun fire or whatever, you chase them back into the sea before they get a foothold in the country and cause havoc. So the earlier you can treat these infections, the quicker you can sweep them off the beaches, the less likely you are for it to get a grip and therefore cause acute infection. But we're not just talking about acute infection. If these microbes make themselves at home in the body, they can then drive many pathologies. So let's look at Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus drives glandular fever or mono as it's known in many countries. It's a very nasty, dangerous virus. And if Epstein-Barr gets a grip in the body, 
We know it drives at least 30 different autoimmune conditions. And guess what? We're seeing epidemics of autoimmunity at the moment. One in 20 of, the pop of Westerners now have an autoimmune condition. In Africa, Epstein-Barr virus drives Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a nasty cancer. And in fact, Epstein-Barr virus has been associated with dementia and other, uh, other cancers. It's a very nasty virus indeed. So guess what? Let's get rid of it before it uh, rears its ugly head in our bodies. And then take vitamin C to bowel tolerance for life to make sure it stays in a dormant form and doesn't become activated. So vitamin C is an incredibly important tool. One question I've been asking myself is what is the mechanism by which vitamin C works? And I've done a search literature and I cannot find a convincing mechanism, but I suspect one possibility has to do with the fact that vitamin C is very similar to sugar. Now, humans can't make their own vitamin C. The reason my little dog Nancy doesn't get scurvy eating a pure meat diet is she can make her own vitamin C. So it's only humans, fruit bats, and guinea pigs that can't make their own vitamin C. We have to consume it. Normally it's made in other mammals by four enzyme steps, which starts with sugar and ends up with vitamin C. The point being, vitamin C and sugar are very similar molecules. They're a very similar shape. In fact, I think of them as two sides of the same coin. So the point here being is if these microbes need sugar to live on and we're starving them with a ketogenic diet, they will then look round for something else that looks like sugar and maybe they grab vitamin C by mistake and they incorporate vitamin C, they use vitamin C as a fuel, but guess what? Vitamin C doesn't work as a fuel and it literally starves the microbes to death because they're trying to burn it, they can't, and that's what kills them. Now, I don't know if that is the mechanism, but it's biologically plausible and it does explain the bowel tolerance mechanism. Flip the bowel tolerance mechanism on its head and we have another very useful clinical tool because what it means is that your bowel tolerance of vitamin C is also a measure of your infectious load. And that infectious load may be part fermenting gut and it may be part systemic infection. Now, in killing any microbe, and it doesn't matter what the microbe is, it's not a battle, it's a war. Because yes, we're trying to prevent acute infection, but we're also trying to prevent that microbe becoming installed in the body and driving pathology long term. And the, you know, the classic example is Lyme disease. You know, it is the great mimic. It can cause almost any uh, pathology you care to mention. For example, we know Lyme is associated with dementia. We know it's associated with Parkinson's disease. And guess what? We're seeing epidemics of both those conditions at the present. In fact, with any degenerative neurological condition, Lyme should be part of the differential diagnosis.